Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are ready and rested for um, this last part of our conference. I'm sure we shall hear many interesting things. I'm hoping personally to learn a lot about the Russian market. But uh, the goal of um, my presentation is to provide you with more insight into other AdBlue markets, as Tim mentioned. Existing AdBlue markets, such as Europe, as well as developing AdBlue markets, such as Brazil and China. Europe is the oldest AdBlue market after Japan, and at Integer Research, we have really been following this market ever since its infancy. We publish a quarterly publication, which is the AdBlue and Dev Monitor, and um, this tracks really all the development in the European and US markets for AdBlue and Dev. Um, developments in pricing, SCR numbers, and any other issues relevant for this market. Europe is the most mature market and is the biggest market in terms of AdBlue consumption. AdBlue consumption started with the implementation of Euro 4 in 2006, and consumption really took off in 2007, which is when um, SCR trucks really hit the road. So the market is about four, five to six years old. There were, of course, initial problems and issues concerning the implementation, but the market has dealt with those issues quite well and has reached a more mature stage now. And this is why I think that Europe is quite a good case study to understand how the ad blue market here is likely to evolve and develop. And it's a good case to draw some lessons from. So in this part of this presentation, I will attempt to give you a good picture of the European market, of how it evolved and where we are at now. So we'll be looking at the OEM after-treatment strategies, the main ad blue market players, quality issues, supply formats, and also the pricing question. Now, currently, there are also several other countries and regions which are implementing emissions legislation and these countries might be in a more similar situation to Russia. At Integer, we're also covering the evolution of these new markets. And as you might know, we have conferences in all of the BRIC countries in China, India, and Brazil. And those countries are actually quite useful cases to look at because they are more similar to Russia on certain levels. They are still developing countries. And they have encountered other issues that we have not dealt with so much in Europe. And that's what I'm going to look at in the second part. I'll be looking at China and Brazil in particular. And um, of course, the main issue, same as here, is the diesel quality, which then influences the regulatory enforcement and leads to delays and even cancellations of emission standards, as we've seen in Brazil. And then we'll quickly look at the OEMs present in those countries and we'll have a consumption forecast for AdBlue. So to start, this is a brief summary of the European market. So Europe is the biggest and most mature market. And SCR trucks first hit road, the road in um, 2006. They were first launched by Daimler. But uh, AdBlue consumption only really took off in 2007, and SCR has been used as a domain after treatment technology by all heavy duty trucks manufacturers. There were initially some technological differences. There were some OEMs um, who were using different technologies for Euro 4, but ever since Euro 5, really, all of the OEMs have chosen to, be, to use um, SCR. And this will also be the case for Euro 6. Now, in terms of our blue consumption, we estimate that currently we have a consumption of 1.4 million tons. And um, as seen in Manfred Schicker's presentation yesterday, the original forecast was quite a bit higher. But then because of the financial crisis, of course, and other issues, this is the actual current market consumption we're at. Now, at the moment, the European market is preparing for the implementation of Euro 6. And this means that NOx limits emissions have to be reduced by quite a bit. This is another 80%. And PM needs to be reduced by another 50%. 
So Europe really was the first major region to be using the SCR technology on heavy-duty ve vehicles to reduce emissions. And ever since all the other markets following and implementing emissions legislation have also been using this technology. The US, for example, also China, as we will see later, and Brazil. And um, this really confirms what we have seen yesterday, that SCR, for several reasons, really is the technology of choice when it comes to reducing emissions. And there was some initial differences, some resistance and hesitations to using the SCR technology. I'm not going to go over the advantages and disadvantages for the technology again. We've seen that yesterday. But um, just to say that in, in Europe, the reason to choose SCR was not really because of sulfur levels in fuel, because sulfur levels in European fuel are fine. It was more also um, a question of efficiency gain, fuel efficiency gain, for example. So let's look at the different European... So in Europe, there are now six OEMs dominating the market, and some of these OEMs have been pushing from SCR from the beginning, like Daimler, for example, and others have been using, two mainly of them have been using EGR for Euro 4. So we have DF Trucks, uh, which is a subsidiary of PACA, and used SCR starting from Euro 4, used it for Euro 5, and will be using a combination of SCR, EGR, and DPF for Euro 6. Then Daimler, which, as I said, was the first OEM to um, be launching SCR models in February 2006. And they, of course, are using SCR as well for Euro 5 and will be using SCR, EGR and DPF for Euro 6. Then we have MAN, who was one of the two OEMs to be using EGR and then moved to SCR for early Euro 5. Um, and will be using SCR, EGR, and DPF for Euro 6. Renault was also using SCR from the beginning, and same all the way through to Euro 6. Iveco also using SCR for the first two stages, and Iveco is to say, interestingly, for um, Euro 6, they have announced that they will not be using EGR, so it will be a combination of SCR and DPF. Then Scania was the other OEM, not you need to be using SCR from the beginning, using EGR, and then moving to SCR and EGR, and same strategy for Euro 6. And finally, Volvo, again, all the way through using SCR. The earliest delivery of SCR vehicles was actually half a year before the implementation of the legislation, and the reasons for, the, for this is quite interesting, because there were financial incentives. This was in Germany. In Germany, you have a, a road usage tax, so depending on how many kilometers you travel every year, you have to pay a tax. And this is actually quite a substantial tax that you have to be paying. And so there, was a, there were incentives, basically, when you were using environmental friendly vehicles, then the tax was reduced. And this uh, was quite a good incentive to take up SCR not only in Germany, but also in surrounding countries, because Germany is basically the main transport corridor. So this led to the successful implementation of SCR trucks all over Europe. This slide, this is a slide taken from our Art Blue and Death Monitor, and we can see the monthly vehicle sales, as well as cumulative vehicle sales for SCR vehicles. Now, there aren't actually any official statistics but uh, we get quite accurate numbers working together with all the OEMs. And you can see the, so in the beginning 2006, not many SCR vehicles on the road. 2007 really took off. And when you look at the three month average, you can see how um, it obviously, after the financial crisis, there was a major depression, vehicle sales dropped. But um, ever since they have really been um, improving, and in October 2011, sales increased by 13% compared to the same period last year, so that was a lot better than expected. So these numbers really determine the outlook consumption. And one of our consumption graphs, so up to 2011, these are actual numbers, and then afterwards, it's a forecast we did on outlook consumption 
in Europe. So this is for passenger cars, uh, sorry, for heavy duty cars and non-road. Passenger cars are not included, but we heard in a presentation yesterday that the passenger car market is actually considering using SCR for the implementation of Euro 6. However, this will not be a big volume of um, AdBlue, even when this is implemented. Then volumes have been increasing year over year. 2011, we have around 1.4 million tons. And um, this was quite a positive year, speaking to suppliers and distributors. Demand remained strong after vehicle sales recovered. If we want to look at the individual European countries, Germany is surely the biggest market in terms of consumption, and is followed by other big countries such as France, Spain, Italy. Now, let's look at the different AdBlue suppliers and producers. So say the competition in Europe is, is quite, are quite a lot of different players interacting in the European market. There are really two different types of AdBlue producers and suppliers. On the one hand, we have the integrated suppliers. So with integrated urea production. So they will manufacture the AdBlue within their urea production facilities which means that, that this, cost, uh, this cuts the costs, obviously, and they are insulated from um, the price hikes in urea. Like, for example, in October, we saw the price going up massively, quite rapidly, and they are more insulated from those market movements. Then we have the non-integrated blue producers and suppliers, so they will purchase urea prills uh, and then dissolve them, and they are obviously more vulnerable to price movements of urea. So here we have a list of the, of the major suppliers. Um, Yara is the, one of the biggest ones, is a Europe-wide and also, of course, worldwide supplier. So this is only for the European market. It's an integrated supplier. And um, then we have BSF, which is one of the biggest chemical companies and also acts as a producer. It's an integrated supplier and is mainly in Germany and its neighbor regions. Um, Green Kang and Agrofert, Europe-wide supplier again. GPN is the largest fertilizer producer in France and is linked to, to Total and dominates pretty much the French market. And then we have some non-integrated ones like Kruse, which is a, a German supplier, and a few other ones. <clears throat> Now, another issue that these suppliers and distributors needed to address when entering the market was the quality problem. So you really need to have good quality add blue, otherwise you contaminate the SCR catalyst and it damages the system. So what happened is that uh, they came up with the ISO standards, which regulate the quality requirements. So the four standards look at quality requirements, then the testing methods, handling transportation questions, storing questions, and refilling interface. So because quality is really so important, the VDA was put in charge to ensure that um, companies which violate the trademark, the AdBlue trademark, are challenged legally. So there are um, quite a few licensed companies in Europe now, but it's actually quite difficult for the VDA to to control the market and especially control companies which do not use the AdBlue trademark. And there have been quality problems, especially with products for coming from um, Eastern Europe. And that's why customers is really, really important. And um, the major OEMs and AdBlue suppliers have undertaken a quality campaign. So here on this slide, we can see an ad that was put in in magazines, because the customers, distributors, and suppliers really need to be aware how important quality is. There are three really important points which they need to be aware of, which are where to buy the product. So you shouldn't be buying product from unlicensed uh, suppliers. And then also how to handle it and how to store the product. And customer awareness really is a crucial issue, and this surely will also be really important for the Russian market, and it's something that you always need to bear in mind. Now, at the supply formats and the pricing evolution, so we have seen, these are really the main supply formats. So we have the canisters, 
which we really only used as a kind of emergency solution because they are quite expensive. And then in the middle we have Minibulk and IBC, which are, IBC is one of the main supply formats. Um, and then we have the pumps at truck stops. And especially the latter one, the pumps have seen quite a, a rapid growth in uh, recent months. There are currently more than 4,000 pump locations in Europe. And on this slide, you can see the pump locations all over Europe. So you can see the most dense network is, is in the, the dark green. It's uh, in the German region, as well as the Benelux states. And then you can also see who the main market players are. For example, in, in France, the market is pretty much dominated by um, AS24, which is part of Total. Then OMV is more in the in the eastern regions of Europe. So, in terms of pricing, then, and this kind of goes together with um, this map, we have seen quite an interesting um, development recently. On this slide, we compare prices from the Dach region, that's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland and from the Benelux states. So IBC prices in, um, this is the great top one, to pump prices, forecourt prices. Benelux and the Dach region are two of the most competitive markets, so prices can be, go very, very low in those two regions. Especially um, Germany has encountered really tough competition with cheaper products coming in from Eastern Europe. And this really drives prices down. So this year has been another quite tough year for German distributors and suppliers in terms of prices. So what, we, what we're looking at on this slide, which is quite interesting, is the, how IBC prices are obviously are quite a lot lower than uh, forecourt prices. But there is actually this difference in pricing between IBC and forecourt is becoming smaller. So uh, in countries like the Benelux states, are, for example, in France, where Total is really actively promoting ad blue supply at pumps, uh, we can see that the price difference is, not, is only a few cents anymore, and so it becomes really more interesting to be using pump supplies instead of IBC supplies. It's also a lot easier. And so this goes with the map we've seen before, with the pump network really expanding quite rapidly recently. So I think these issues will all be quite relevant for the Russian market. But there are other factors, other problems that we have not really encountered in Europe, which will play a bigger role in Russia. And so that's why it's good to look at Brazil and China now. Then we'll, I will highlight some difficulties in both countries. So the first and most important issue is, again, fuel quality, and that influences then and leads to delays of emissions legislation, cancellation. And there's also a problem in those countries of regulatory enforcement, so that the legislation is existent, but it's not really enforced. And in that case, nothing really happens. So quickly to just compare countries, the four BRIC countries, these are medium and heavy duty vehicle production in the four countries. You can obviously see that China is by far the biggest market, um, and even when after 2008 production was decreasing in other countries, China still kept growing. However, the Russian market is maybe the smallest market, but uh, still has quite a lot of potential, we think. So let's look at Brazil first. Brazil, in terms of the market size, might be closest to Russia. And Brazil is the most advanced of all the big countries when it comes to emissions legislation. But the country has also encountered problems, and here's a brief overview of um, what went wrong in Brazil. So Brazil implemented Proconve P5, it's called, and that's the equivalent to Euro 3. And then they were supposed to implement Proconve P6, which is equivalent to Euro 4, and this was supposed to happen in 2009. But because of fuel quality issues, because the fuel standards were not defined at the right time and it wasn't available, the network wasn't available. So because of that, and this is quite a unique case, Brazil decided to cancel completely Proconve P6 and move directly to Proconve P7, which is the equivalent of Euro 5. 
And so the implementation date for P7 was actually in January, so that just came in. So it's going to be interesting to see how the ad blue market is going to develop from now on. Let's quickly look at the diesel issue in Brazil, and this is again quite similar to Russia, and this is because there's not one type of diesel available, but there is, at the moment, there's four, four different types almost. So 50 ppm diesel <coughs> was available from 2009 for bus fleets, and since this uh, January is available for the P7 fleet, so for all the vehicles using um, SCR. Then S10 will replace S50 in one year's time. Then there's S500, which will remain available, and there's no real plan to phase that out. And there's also S1800, that's 1800 ppm, and this is supposed to be phased out by 2014. And so it's quite confusing. As we heard yesterday, you have all those different types of diesels available at the same time. Customers don't quite know which one to use. So that's, that's certainly going to be an issue in Brazil as well. Let's quickly look at the heat. <coughs> so the, the major OEMs in Brazil are European OEMs, or foreign OEMs. We have Mercedes-Benz, which is quite dominant, and Volkswagen. And these OEMs have all chosen to use SCR to some degree. So, because those OEMs also have experience in the European market and other markets with SCR vehicles. And let's move over to the Chinese market. So China is by far the, the biggest market for vehicles and is also going to be the biggest market in terms of outlook consumption for sure, but has also seen many delays and other problems and most recently, the, in mid-January, the government has an, announced another delay of emissions legislation. So the current standard in China is China 3, which is equivalent to Euro 3. However, certain big cities, as we heard, like Beijing and Shanghai, already have more stringent emissions legislation, are already on China 4, and are planning to move to China 5 in some cases. Then the next... The next stage to be implemented is going to be China 4, which is the equivalent of Euro 4. And this was already supposed to happen last year. Then it was delayed. It was supposed to happen this year. And then it was delayed again, most recently. And now we think, well, the government says that uh, the next implementation stage is going to be July 2013. So um, we'll see if that day changes again. Um, there were the same reasons again as in Brazil, and that's the lack of good quality diesel. In both countries, I'd say, and also here, it's not really because those countries and the refineries can't produce the diesel. That's not really an issue. But, um, like, for example, in China, you already have 50 ppm diesel in some cities. But the real issue is the price, and because it is obviously more expensive to produce low sulfur fuel, and then it's also quite a bit more expensive to then distribute it. And if there's no financial incentive for the producers, if there's no government pressure, then it's not really a reason for them to go ahead and implement it. So China, for example, they were most recently stating that they were going to reduce taxes for oil companies who were going to produce lower sulfur diesel, but it's not set yet. So in China, you actually have uh, sulfur content between 500 and 2,000. It was originally planned to implement 350 ppm by last summer. That was, however, delayed. And now there's not really, there's no official implementation date for 350 ppm diesel. It just has to happen before July 2013, but the government has not given a real date. Then the Chinese OEM market is quite a bit different from the one in Brazil because the major OEMs are all Chinese. And so China National, Dongfeng, and Fa are the main ones. There are not many foreign companies, but they have often they have joint venture with these companies, really. Then on this last slide, we show our consumption forecast. Comparing, this is, these are our base cases. So basically for both countries, we have done several scenarios, taking different factors into account. And this, these are our lowest forecasts. So the Brazil-based case and the China-based case compared to 
European actual consumption and North American consumption. And this is where you can see that uh, yeah, China is basically going to be the, the main market. Our, our upper case was quite a lot higher than this. So this is um, quite interesting to see compared to the European and North American market. And it would e easily overtake those two markets. Brazil is also quite a strong market, not as big as Europe and North America, however. So I think um, there's quite a few things that Russia can learn from these cases from both <coughs> Europe and from Brazil and from China. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And of course, also, you can also come and talk to me and my colleagues during the break. And uh, I hope you learned something from this. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the next presentations. Thank you very much.